Hey everyone, I am Steve from GamersNexus.net and this is another Ask GN video. This is our fourth episode, I believe, of Ask GN and I'm pretty excited with how they've gone so far actually because the questions that you all propose have actually sort of inspired us in a few ways to do some new articles, new tests, things like that. And it's gotten us to think about hardware in sometimes ways that we haven't before or we haven't done in a long time. So please keep the questions coming, post them below on this video. I check the most recent Ask GN video first before filming the next one. And I normally film only one day in advance. So I'm, I'm trying to do these every Monday at this point. So today the, the first question we have is a pretty simple one. It's from, uh, sorry about the pronunciation here, Nishant Shikaria, who says, any news on AMD Zen CPU launch? So I just posted an article about this and the AMD Zen architecture, for those who don't know, is AMD's next architecture following the Bulldozer, Piledriver, Steamroller lineup, which we are presently on. So the current Kaveri APUs are using Steamroller modules in them, which used to be called Bulldozer modules, still kind of correct, but they're upgraded. And the next architecture from AMD is the Zen architecture, and that has, so far, a lot of hype behind it. There were a couple of rumors from motherboard manufacturers who were unnamed as told to, I believe it was Digitimes, maybe? I, I think it was Digitimes said that unnamed motherboard sources predicted a 40% performance gain with Zen over the current architecture. That's a very big claim. So mountain of salt with that, it's not verified, but that's sort of what we know so far. In terms of the launch date, there's no hard launch date as of yet. The current rumor is fourth quarter 2016, so that's about a year from now, and that's unconfirmed. It could be later, it could be earlier, but I, I really sincerely don't think it will be. It's We're looking at fourth quarter 2016 or later at this point, uh, maybe third quarter, but I don't think that's going to be the case. Dark Drifter asks, best sub $100 CPU for gaming. So depending on how sub $100 you mean, there are a couple of options here. The most immediate one I would point toward would be something like the 4130 or 4160 i3 CPUs. Those are priced at $120. So it's not technically sub 100, but it's very close. And the $20 gets you a lot of performance over the actual sub $100 CPUs, which would be the G3258 Pentium and the 860K, soon to be replaced by the 880K in theory, if that ever comes out. So those would be the three to look at. If you can afford the i3 at around 120-ish dollars, it's it's very good. We've found it to be basically, uh, unless you're using a high-end GPU that's gonna bottleneck on the CPU, we found it to be effectively as good as most gamers will need unless you're really starting to push thread-intensive games and there's not a lot of those out there. So if you are doing thread-intensive games, you probably already know that you are, but those would be things like the CryEngine, for instance, has the ability to use all the threads. It doesn't always do that, but it's threaded for up to eight spawns. So it can spawn eight threads. One of those is the physics processing, one is the game logic, and then you've got rendering and all that other stuff in there as well. So CryEngine games have the ability to use more threads, but for the most part, you'll be just fine on an i3. Now that said, a lot of people will be just fine on an 860K as well, and even a G3258. So unless you're playing like GTA V, which we talked about in a similar discussion previously, then the 860K and the G3258 are fine CPUs at the sub $100 price point. The G3258 I think is maybe $5 cheaper than the 860K, which is a $75 CPU. And the 860K, the only reason I generally recommend it over the G3258, which is still a very good Pentium CPU, is because the... Pentium, the G3258, is, it has trouble sometimes with heavily multi-threaded games like GTA V. It will push a high average FPS, 75 in the case of the most recent test I did with a 980 Ti. It's pretty darn good for normal settings on GTA V with a Pentium dual core CPU, but it's 0.1% low numbers are not very good. And I, I think I talked about what those numbers mean in episode two of AskGN, so check that out if you don't know. But the 0.1% lows on the Pentium were like four FPS, something around that range. And the 860K, even though it had a lower average in the 60s, average FPS, 
the 0.1% was much higher to the point where it was actually more playable. So that is what you're looking at for the sub $100 range, but if you can afford the $20, I would push into the i3 area. Otherwise, 860K would probably be one of my main go-tos. G3258 if you're not playing heavily multi-threaded games. And it overclocks really well, so throw that in there too. Next question, Homer Thompson says, Hey Steve, do you think the i7-5930K is at all worth it over the i7-5820K to run two 980Ti video cards at by 16x16 by 16 or by 16x8, by, by 16 by excuse me, for 4K gaming? Uh, so... The 5930K and the 5820K, those are two X99 CPUs. For those who don't know, we'll run through the specs very quickly. The more expensive one would be the 5930K. It's in the $500 to $600 range. The other one, the 5820K, is in the $390 range at last check on Newegg. So those are the, the two price points for X99 without going into the $1,000 really high-end CPU area. Both of them are six-core CPUs, both of them are clocked about the same. I think it's 3.3 gigahertz versus 3.5, somewhere in that, that range. And so you're getting a pretty small clock increase, but what's actually the thing you're paying for is the PCIe lane count increase. The 5930K has 40 lanes and the 5820 has 28 lanes. So that's what Homer is asking about here is, is the extra lane count worth it to run two video cards and by 16 by 16 versus being forced down to x16 x8 or by 16 by 8 depending on how you want to say it so the the lane assignment here is definitely a thing to research and be concerned about as you're doing it's it's a good thing to ask about but in general for the current architecture gpus they're not pushing enough throughput to actually saturate that by 16 PCIe 3.0 interface. You're really not going to have that much to worry about at by 16 by 8 versus by 16 by 16. The difference is negligible and this is something that we're going to test and publish soon. I have tested it but not comprehensively enough to publish charts just yet. It's something we're going to do soon. Other websites have done it in the past. Uh, we're just going to refresh it but if you're curious you can look at past benchmarks that have done this exact scenario, different CPUs, but exact scenario otherwise. And the general idea is that because the throughput of PCIe 3.0 is so high, just with one lane, you with eight lanes, with 16 lanes, you're going to see effectively identical performance, even in SLI. Now, that said, you're instantly consuming all of your lanes. So if you run with the 28 lane 5820K, you're not going to have really any lanes left over for other PCI or expansion devices. So if you're running or hoping to run an M2 SSD, the M.2 SSDs will generally, the good ones, will want four lanes dedicated to them or at least two. So do keep that in mind. That's where you start losing performance is when you're trying to throw in other PCIe devices or if it's not a PCIe device, keep in mind that other interfaces will still use PCIe lanes. So an M.2 interface on the motherboard will use PCIe lanes from the chipset or the CPU or somewhere in the system. And that's true for some other devices as well. To answer the question very directly, no, is it is not worth it strictly for that scenario, but it is worth it if you want the allowance for another device. So hopefully that makes sense. Please let me know if anyone has questions about the subject. And the last question for today is from Josh Orenberg who says, Another question, does AMD have PhysX equivalent? What's the situation on the AMD side? This is another good question, and this is one that's been around for quite a while now. Um, PhysX got its dawn when IGEA was purchased by NVIDIA, or its patents were purchased by NVIDIA, and that happened a number of years ago. So for those who don't remember the company, they made physics processors. So they basically took what is now an extra GPU, they made a physics coprocessor. They put it on a card. You put that in your PCI interface, PCI Express interface, and then that handled all of your game physics processing. They were actually pretty popular, and they were very high performing toward the end of their tenure. So NVIDIA bought that technology and turned it into PhysX, which is a solution that now lives on the GPUs and in the drivers of the video cards that they produce. PhysX will technically run on AMD devices, really not 
always the best. It doesn't always work either. So it just depends on the game and how intensive it is. But does AMD have a physics equivalent? No, they do not. AMD is very good at things like OpenCL and compute, actually better than Nvidia in some ways, but that doesn't really show in a lot of games because of how games are built. And that's something I discussed in the Fury X review. Check that out if you're curious. But AMD is very good at OpenCL. AMD also is basically optimizing for things like the Havoc engine, which is a physics engine that game developers use. It's a pretty popular one actually, and build into their games to handle all the physics computations. So when you're using something like Havoc, some of that will be, uh, it's basically software accelerated physics. So it does all the processing and it's uh, all coded through an extra engine that is available to the game developer. So it's simplified for them by the Havoc team. But then the GPU, depending on how it's programmed, is capable of taking some of that computation and running it itself rather than sending it through the CPU, which is a sequential processor. CPU is not very good unless there's some exceptions to modern CPUs, but in general, they're not very good at processing things that live much better on parallel uh, architectures like physics does. So AMD basically takes their OpenCL advantage where it's applicable. They will use that advantage to do all the processing on the GPU without building their own PhysX equivalent. And that's not always possible. So in the cases where it's not, they rely on things like the Havoc engine and other software accelerated engines or hardware accelerated software solutions, depending on how you wanna word it. And they'll rely on those to do the, the work of pushing the numbers around to different devices. There is no PhysX equivalent though, to answer the question very plainly. So that is all for this Ask GN episode. I am currently on the way to an, another meeting in another state, so traveling again but we'll have a lot more videos once back and that will be on Tuesday or Wednesday. So back pretty shortly here this time, not gone very long. And check out the website for more articles. Recently wrote a big one about AMD and their current situation. It's got a lot of financial information, pretty heavy on the numbers side. But it's also got a lot of information just about recent launches, future launches like the uh, Fiji and Zen stuff that's going on. So check that out if you're curious about how the industry is going. And then, of course, the Witcher 3 video we posted recently is pretty cool, too, I think, because it talks about the financials of the game industry and what a game costs. So that's all for this time. Please post more questions below if you have them. I really appreciate them. They're pretty fun to work on and give us a few article ideas as well. If you like this content, as always, hit the Patreon link in the post roll video. We've gone up another one or two Patreon supporters since the last time that I mentioned it. So... Big thanks to all of you who have contributed thus far, and we hope more of you will jump on board and support the site. So check that out, and I will see you all next time. <laughs>